Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 19th of March 2024. It's Martin North here from Digital Finance Analysis. Great to have you on and uh, nice to see some uh, familiar faces and also some new names too. So welcome, welcome. And, uh, you know, as I always say on these shows, uh, they only work because you're here and uh, asking the questions and making the comments. So uh, feel free to do that. Just before I bring Tony in, let me just remind you, as I always do, that we don't provide specific financial or legal advice on this channel. This is a general conversation. We do moderate the chat but feel free to throw your comments and suggestions into the chat. And uh, this is as at the 19th of March, 2024, if you're watching in replay. If you'd like to get an, a question directly to me and Tony, if you use that Walk the World, then that goes into my separate queue. And that means I'm more likely to see it. And also I've enabled Super Chat, which means that if you want to make a contribution to what we do around here, or indeed get your question top of the list, you can do that using Super Chat. And I as I often say, don't do this for profit. I do this because I think there's a really important conversation to be had. And frankly, I think the mainstream media are letting us down. So there are things we want to talk about. Anyway, with that, I'm going to bring Tony in and uh, we'll get started. Tony, hello. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Martin, whatever time it is there. And uh, good uh, good evening to, to all your viewers. Uh, this, this channel has just absolutely gone to the next level and... I'm almost not worthy to be here, and I'm going to admit to some pre-show nerves today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come up with something new. Uh, my presentation style and my slides haven't really changed, but um, yeah, so to speak, I'm I'm coming out as the master of my own surveys. <laughs> as you know, I should have said that closer together. <laughs> I can guarantee you, I'm a he him. And um, I have a future wife, and what's been quite good the last three weeks is we flew my mother-in-law over from Hungary, and I've had a three-week holiday. It's been amazing. And the two words I've been hearing are of Anthony, sport, and the three magic words are Anthony, good boy. So uh, I'm a winner with the mother-in-law, and yeah, much happier to, to be at home and doing these shows and, and just seeing how happy my partner is um, with the mum here. So uh, happy days and, uh, yeah, hopefully my, my nerves will dissipate a bit. But, um, yeah, I, I still, this is actually hard work going on camera and being a, a provider of information um, rather than a keyboard warrior. So, you know, people, people should really... At least give us some admiration <laughs> rather than bag the shit out of us because I've got no agenda. I'll just tell it how it is. Uh, my nickname's Truth Bomb Tony. And um, if I drop a few, um, th that's it. So great to be here, Martin. I really appreciate the support you've given me. And uh, I think I should shut up now. <laughs> no, that's great, Tony. Well, uh, great to have you on again. And, uh, yeah. you know, there will be a few people wanting to play Le Cantro Bingo, of course, with uh, some of your, your famous sayings. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a really interesting uh, conversation to be had about you know, what's going on in the world. And uh, we're a bit philosophical on this channel. And uh, I think that's important because quite a lot of the uh, conversations that other people are having are um, a little, um, what shall I say, myopic, I think, in terms of the way they think. But uh, both you and I, Join the dots a little bit, and uh, I think we're going to do a bit of that. But, of course, there are quite a few people in the chat asking about the monkey, so you'll have to explain about the monkey. Oh, that, that's that's an in-joke. Uh, my, myself and Juliana ha have given the name of the monkey uh, as one of my friends, and it relates to a saying, and I uh, what a gift, 20 bucks at Ikea. And um, he's, he's a regular... To these shows a regular on my interviews so uh he'll he'll hang about i do have some other toys of my uh my dog uh he's he's an akita actually he's um he's got the b best personality but you just don't want to be a cat so um yep the monkey stays excellent i should just explain for some reason my uh my chat isn't working this evening so i can see it on uh, one screen but i can't see it on the other one so i'm not sure what happened there so i um, apologize for not being able to show the on-screen chat tonight but i'll read out the comments as we go so tony i think we're going to start with uh, a bit of a presentation from your end so you might want to fire up your screen share yeah new new style of slides tonight uh God, AI is a beast, isn't it? <laughs> amazing amazing oh, what you can it's do. It's amazing. And 
the the guy that helps him with this, I think he's pretty much accepted the fact that he's he's out of a job. <laughs> um, I mean, it'd be like owning a uh, fleet of blockbuster stores or or a um, a DVD business. Uh, you just, I guess, you just have to go with the times. But uh, shit, it's going to decimate decimate um, a lot of industries. And uh, yeah, so more to follow on that. Look, tonight I'm going to start off with a disclaimer. Uh, pretty much none of this can be taken as personal advice. I don't know how much risk you guys like to take. Um, I know Cookie's at that extreme end of risk, which is fantastic. But, uh, yeah, if you have any doubts, you want to discuss it, uh, go to your, your better half or um, ask someone and see, see who cares. But, anyway, I'll start with that. Um, I'm just going to tell the truth. Uh, I'm not sponsored by anyone. I'm not not selling you anything. I'm not an influencer. Anyway, that's the disclaimer, guys. Read that at your leisure. So this is the um, the topic. Uh, I think are we being complacent before the storm, or is this the new norm? And I think this is a very important subject to discuss because from what I'm seeing, uh, I am. On the complacent side, I'm certainly thinking that that's the way we've we've become. And normally, when you're complacent, that, that's when you're going to get slapped around. And uh, now that AI there, Martin, that is some um, top shelf stuff there. So basically, I've found that uh, this this channel, I've met a lot of really lovely people, and one of the best. One of my best clients I've ever met, I've been doing this stuff coming up to 26 years, uh, was Simon El-Rahi. Uh, Martin, he was one of your biggest fans. And uh, we, we became quite good friends. Unfortunately, I never got to meet him. Uh, not only is Simon an iconic actor, uh, if you want to watch something different, he's currently starring... And what could be his last, would have been his last program, um, House of Gods on the ABC. He was in The Last King of the Cross. I, I joked about him, how many cigarettes he had. He said they were herbal, they, they were safe. But th this, um, oh, I've just so wanted to meet Simon through through this channel. I, I knew he, he was in a, a bit of trouble. And I, I thought, well, I I'll leave Simon alone. And um, I paid the price for that. I guess, I guess I was hoping that there'd be a miracle that he'd get better. But um, he died in November last year, and certainly one of the nicest people you'll you'll ever have to deal with. And uh, he spoke about the industry a lot. He was a mentor to a lot of young actors. Uh, he plays the the I don't know. He, he's got that look about him which. Uh, just an amazing actor. So anyway, I thought I'd dedicate um, the program to him. Um, I don't like losing any clients, but when they're one of the best. But um, any, anyway, to to his family, I know um, that it's all downhill from here, guys, unfortunately, because um, back to regular proceedings. So the new norm. Um, I'm hoping that's not it. That's certainly... Something that um, oh, certainly the path I could have headed down. Uh, I don't know how many of you are around my age, but we have the old norm up in the background. And I just think that that's, that's a way of life. You know, I did my best to avoid. Um, you know, you get down, you just don't have any motivation and um, your life becomes a mess. And I, I'm hoping that, what, what we're going through at the moment, that people can lift themselves up and make some positive changes. Anyway, that's um, quite a disgusting photo, but uh, that's AI these days, guys. So anyway, we just I'm just going to discuss all the important issues here. Uh, these three women have pretty much blown up the internet. Uh, Sam Kerr, uh, apparently on a night out in, in London, uh, had, had a, a vomit in a taxi. Uh, we don't know what she called 
the police officer exactly, but something along along the lines of a, a white stupid cop or, or a white stupid bastard. Uh, I don't I don't know. Um, I, I didn't spend too much time on this thinking about it. Uh, I actually worked at Redfern Police Station during the mid '90s riots, and I was called a white chocolate raspberry muffin on more than one occasion. So I just thought, well, okay, toughen up. So whether or not it's racist, who knows? But um, that was a huge issue. And I guess it's not not a good look for someone who's apparently a role model to to lots of young girls. So I'm hoping she can get through that along with her ACL. Uh, Kate Middleton uh, doctored a photo. To what extent? Oh, I don't know, but... Uh, you know, X is alive with these conspiracy theories about King Charles, about Kate, about William, about affairs. Anyway, yep, I could spend my life on on that conspiracy theory. I was actually I was out walking um Colin. Uh Colin's my Akita that I rescued from the dog shelter. And I looked up and I actually saw my first UFO. O's, and they were going across the sky in perfect formation. Uh, when I got home, I Googled it, and apparently it was the Starlink satellite. So anyway, worth watching. And the lady on the right, uh, Sydney Sweeney, um, she's blowing up um, the internet. I think it's due to her earrings and her IQ level. So yeah, uh, no, no complaints, people. We're, we're discussing all the hot issues on DFA. Now, this is the lady that should be blowing up our internet, Michelle Bullock. So she's addressed the crowd today, uh, rates on hold. I I guess it's really complacency here. Uh, no one really expected much action, but in which direction do they go next? We've got those who are saying we're going to get cuts later this year. Shane Elliott from the ANZ says, uh, don't be so quick. Are we going to get more uh, more of a holding pattern? I, I just think, you know, that they're at the point now where some tough decisions have been made. And when you when you go into these uh, decisions, I just think it reeks of complacency. And for those interested, I just glanced at the new uh, schedule of the RBA meetings, and I think they'll release, they have two days. They go into camp for two days. And they'll come out on the second day with a decision. And if I'm correct, I think the next one is on the 7th of May. Are we just going to have a simple hold? Uh, who knows? But um, I, don't, I don't see much in the way of relief. Interestingly, there's been a bit of publicity about Japan, the end of cheap money in Japan. Uh, you know, the Japanese going into um, stagflation which uh, is actually far worse than being sandpapered to death or for a carnival like me um, being scrubbed in beef tallow. So there, there you go. I think we're, we're certainly at an interesting point in the world. But, um, yeah, um, she, she doesn't smile a lot, uh, but I, I think she's, she's delivered the right dose. of. I think she's quite assertive. She's quite stern kind of a, a no bullshit school principal type. But um, yeah, I guess we, we're all, keep an eye out for the 7th of May. So uh, thanks to um, Cookie Boy. Uh, so what what we're seeing is, is a real absolute shit show in, in the real estate rental buyers market. Uh, it's, you know, we've got record low stock everywhere. That article refers to Brisbane. Um, we've got some some sheds going in Perth for three hundred and twenty dollars a week, and I just looked at those rental increases. Uh, suburbs like Adderdale up thirty five percent in in January. Uh, North Coogee up thirty two percent. Aurelia, which is where investors are buying, un unseen. Um, hey, wake up! Uh, these suburbs are cheap for a reason. Uh, Netherlands, where you need a, a passport to go to, up 22%. Uh, Dianella, around um, not far from where I live, actually, um, rents to $700. So if you look at 
how families are being squeezed, uh, it's just absolutely atrocious because you're looking at $36,000, $37,000 post-tax before you get anywhere. And uh, I, I follow uh, realestate.com and, and I keyed in houses in Perth for rent up to $600 a week and there's 453 properties. That's a house. Uh, that could be a one-bedroom, two-bedroom ship box with an outside toilet. But then if you increase the amount to $700 a week, there was 909 properties available. And at this point, I've actually noticed a bit of a slight increase. Uh, Realestate.com had total properties at 2,032 last I looked. Now it's up around 2,300. But if you're looking for anything in that six 700 range, uh, or, or actually trying to go anything cheaper, I mean, um, you've got the Buckley family tree of, of finding that. And, and down the bottom, there's a an outdoor bed, uh, an Airbnb, uh, $130 a night in Perth. And the owners justified that by, by saying that it's good to sleep outdoors. So uh, there you go. There's $900 a week for a, looks like a mattress outside somewhere near a granny flat. So really, I, I don't know how anyone can be cheering what's going on, on in this country. Uh, we had obviously COVID put things out of whack, but it's just been an absolute, you know, it's an atrocity with what's happening with um, the rents, uh, with what's happening with with the markets. It's just so out of kilter. But I'm just going to reiterate to everyone, this isn't the new norm. I don't know what's going to break it. it it'll have to be, I think, a gradual event. Uh, we will get towards the norm and then perhaps even overshoot to the downside. But whilst I was putting this together, I thought... In a normal market, a family could sell their 1.6 million two bedroom home in Campsie with one bathroom and then go and rent somewhere. And then they say, hey, Kaching, we'll, we'll take our lotto win. But now you're at the point where you just can't simply sell at an overpriced level and, and find a rental. Uh, you'll have to go and rent a motor home. Uh, you'll have to go and put your, your stuff in storage. Um, waste hours selling your crap on Gumtree for no return and then look for somewhere else to live? Do you couch surf? Do you move somewhere? Uh, exactly. But that isn't a normal market. And I guess the fact that you just can't simply switch between owning and renting indicates how much that market is out of kilter. But, it, but again, I know you've discussed it a lot, Martin, but it really, this if this doesn't put people into stress, I don't know what will if they're not already stressed already. So uh, I went went through some of your material, Martin, and uh, this is that's great. Um, well, it's not great, but it shows you know, you're under budget budget pressures, missing payments. Uh, I'd I'd love to get every late feedback. I'm, I'm just I'm I'm a bit lazy. I don't know. I'm a procrastinator. Um, but uh, no, I'm certainly not one to um, pay my bills early. And then, uh, you know, families become insolvent. And I, I look at the number of speculators that have opened up cafes, that have opened up businesses, that have opened up boutique building firms. As essentially, a, a speculator like I am or, or a farmer where they haven't done haven't done the research and they've actually absolutely been squeezed, but businesses are going under. You're going to see lots of full lease signs, uh, commercial real estate. You're going to see lots of shops closed down and boarded up, and maybe some of our cities will start to look like Dublin circa 2010. But again, we haven't really had a serious uptick in unemployment. And and businesses, I think, are struggling. Uh, I've certainly given up takeaway coffee uh, where possible. And I've given up. Uh, actually, my diet's kind of restricted me from going out a bit. 
mind you, Crown Epicurean is a good place for a carnival. But, yeah, I think we're all going to stop spending. We're all going to stop buying crap where people have thought they could have a side gig and do some nice craft and art because, in the end, all of that shit means nothing if it's not cash. And from a financial household perspective, I'm going to uh, start looking around the house for anything that, you know, just, just to raise a bit of cash. Um, obviously, the best time to to sell stuff was yesterday and just see where we can raise some money and um, at least can't raise some money, give it to charity. But I think that personal stress is only going to increase. Uh, that's probably the scariest chart that I've ever seen, Martin. Um and people say, well, okay, why hasn't things cracked yet? Sure, you're going to see people paying $3 million to, to live in a crap hole in Bondi that needs a couple of million dollars spent on it. You're going to see all the news stories, but you you look into the um, the lower-priced houses, uh, the mid-stuff, it's actually, it's actually hard, and you try and sell into this market at a at a price where you're looking for your break even. And I'd say in some cases, good luck with that. But uh, mortgage stress, um, rental stress, that's just through the roof. Uh, when you've got uh, rents in Perth going up around 40%, and that probably coincides with um, meth use going up 40% as well. So again, mortgage stress, a huge issue. Mortgage stress then leads to um, social stress, domestic violence, uh, you name it. There's actually some articles I've read where couples are electing to stay together um, because I can't, I can't afford the legal fees to get divorced. So, again, you're forced to stay together during COVID and now you can't afford to break uh, your marriage or relationship uh, because you simply can't afford it. So um, I guess uh, there'll be lots of hall passes given out. Again, more frightening figures. Um, you know, you look at you look at WA there, not not looking pretty. You look at uh, Tasmania, where the 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 housing bubble really took off. The speculative money headed south that didn't want to go to Adelaide or or Perth, and I think um, you know buying property in Tasmania. Tasmania, it's a bit like Scientology, um, easy to get into, impossible to get out of. And that's what Australians have um, and overseas investors have become attached to, simply going in, a um, lot, lot of houses in some really um, less than desirable suburbs in Perth being bought uh, with people not even looking at them. Um, yeah, you know, Meth lab with a chance of a drive-by in some in some cases, or cloudy with a chance of meatballs. But again, it's just FOMO-driven insanity. We've seen some of our uh, least desirable suburbs up up around forty percent. They were they were good buys. Some houses in in certain areas you could buy with a one in front of them, a, a low two, but that window's closed. But um, I'll, I'll say to people that there's still lots of value within a 12-kilometre radius of the Perth CBD, Carron Up Shopping Centre and Trig Beach. So there's still value around. You just have to buy slightly dodge. I've noticed that the, the amount of discarded nangs in my area is virtually down to zero. But again... Uh, stress, we've got a lot of, mind you, we've got a lot of houses being bought without mortgages. So, um, yeah, good luck with that. Thanks again to Cookie. Uh, so we've got migrant levels at record highs. Uh, we've got the influx influx of the Irish. Anyone out on St. Some, some Pat's Day would uh, realise that. And again, they're, they're competing with us for places to live, places to rent. A lot of the um, Irish I know tend to live up in the northern suburbs of, of Perth. Uh, that that area just keeps getting extended by the freeway and new railway stations. But I, I can understand the amount of anger towards this. Uh, we are competing, you know, for limited space. And uh, if you want to rent 
a, a room out with 11 other people, um, you're looking at a ridiculous rate. And I think landlords are certainly catch, uh, cashing in on, on what, say, on what's a great shortage. Um, so I've been doing my own surveys, guys. Uh, anyway, here it comes. There you go. Um, in October last year, I thought I'm going to have a go at the, the gig economy. So I went through all, all the procedures and I've, um, yep, I've, I've, I've been driving Uber and I've, act, I've absolutely in, enjoyed the experience, I, I think. Uh, and funnily enough, it coincided with my the worst months of my career, actually, as, as a stockbroker. So I used to get uh, 30, 40, 50 phone calls a day. That dropped down to about three. And, uh, yeah, this, this was quite, um, quite an interesting thing to do. Uh, obviously, in my in my previous uh, career, I was a police officer, so I'm used to driving for long periods. But this this has probably been the biggest eye opener of my life. I've had um, I've done over twelve over twelve hundred trips. I've picked up every type of person possible um, in in the literal sense. And I think uh, it's it's like a uni university degree in human psychology, uh, human behaviour. What I have noticed that there's no shortage of people going to Sunday sessions and talking about how, how many cocktails they're going to consume. I had a really polite kid on, on a long trip and he said, excuse me, sir, I'm really sorry, but I need to yak. And that was that intense panic, panic that, that you go through on that. Uh, I had a female sit in the front and she said, I'm as drunk as shit. I've taken three Valium. I hope you don't mind, but I'm on the way to my niece's ballet concert. But um, on, on the whole, uh, it's been positive. Um, you'd actually be surprised how many people are aware not only of the cost of living pressure, there's quite a, a big awareness of the real estate madness over east. I have done a lot of trips with the Irish and uh, they're, they're loving it here, but they all want to live in Scarborough or, or Frio. So you know, I mentioned to them, look, you, you're looking at a minimum of $700 a week for any anywhere decent to live. Um, haven't really had to play any tactics uh, can can get frustrating um, staying around the airport. Uh, but what it has done is it's taught me the value of money. And I look at I look at expenditure as to how many hours do I have to drive? Um, how much is that relative to a lamb roast or a kilo of steak? But but on the whole, uh, pretty much ninety nine point nine nine percent of people are simply doing their best. Uh, you know, the other, the minority have, have caused me some grief. But I just think really uh, it's it's just been great for my mental health. Um, but what, what I, probably the key takeaway for me has been that when, when my job wasn't cranking, this was easy. I had the mental and physical energy to do this but as soon as actually uh, my job has just gone nuts lately and I'm taking up to 70 phone calls a day, I've had a few stocks that have done some weird shit and that's that's every phone call is a mental battle and the last thing you want to do is get in the car and drive and I think my my concern for, for families out there is you just can't get an easy second job if your first one is is demanding, and I think that's that's a lesson that that I've certainly learnt. Um, I'm not afraid to show you um, some earning examples. So plenty of surveys. Um, I've I've had um, some great networking. Met a lot of people uh, on the mines. Uh, Learn a lot about gold, iron ore, life of FIFO. Uh, met some famous. Oh, semi-famous people. Actually, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call him famous, but um, lots of good chat. I think there are a lot of passengers are stunned that 
I'm, I'm not bad at holding a conversation. If I want to kill the conversation, um, I'll just simply tell them plants are trying to kill you and fruit is bad for you and um, awkward silence the rest of the way. For those wondering, the best vocal performances whilst driving come from uh, Goo Goo Dolls' Iris. Um, that's the song that most people sing to. I have a default position of easy, easy listening, but I have a playlist for everyone. So there we go. Um, 4.99. Someone gave me one star, said I was rude. Uh, acceptance rate, 94%. Basically, I accept 94%. My cancellation rate's zero. On a typical weekend, uh, you can work out that that's $43 an hour there from the 4th to the 11th of March. Uh, probably my hardest working week was Christmas to New Year's, uh, where again I went hard at it. Uh, that was that was quite good. Um, they they paid a two hundred and twenty dollar bonus. I got eighty eight dollars in tips plus cash, so that came in at about forty three dollars an hour. Don't ever think that's gross. That's gross. So I've got to pay for my own fuel. But I think uh, the mental health benefits and getting out of the house and doing something different um, has certainly been worth it. So, yeah, happy to um, discuss that. Would I, it's certainly not for everyone. And my my fear is that I've noticed that drivers in New Zealand are already complaining about heavily diluted earnings, and I, I guess um, we're going to have a flood of people. But um, anyway, they're my surveys, Martin. So what, what I'm doing now pretty much is sticking with how I've got through the last 25, 26 years, and that's looking at the real unloved and downtrodden stocks on, on the market. I'm, I'm a contrarian. Having contrarian mind means that not only do you, you you'll never win a footy tipping comp because my contrarian mind's taken over already, but you spend a lot of your time underwater and you're buying assets pretty much that no one else wants to own you're buying companies that no one wants to own and then you, you're going to cop it you're going to cop it's like that poor guy that poor kid there but I, I will say that um prior to this program and getting to know um cookie quite well i'm going to come out and say that um cookie is one of the best back foot buyers of un, unloved little stocks I've ever seen. And uh, I hope you're not embarrassed by that cookie, but um, not only do you help out a lot of people, but geez, you've got some balls. And I think, you know, some might think you're just a key, keyboard warrior, but um, nothing could be further from the truth. So that's what I do. Um, I help people try and buy undervalued assets with a view that one day they'll turn around uh, sometimes they turn around a lot sooner. Um, I love gold stocks. If you want to look at a mismatch, um, you don't have to look at our competitor at the moment, Married at First Sight. You just have to look at the uh, gold price relative to junior gold equities. And with rec near record high gold prices, the gold stocks have been unloved. You can buy stocks for a quarter, a third, to what they would be trading at in any given market. So I've certainly identified some, some great gold stocks. Obviously, the producers have done well, but the key is to buy when no one else wants to. Uh, in Biotex, one of my little tiddlers, which um, was certainly the red-headed stepchild of the family, it, it had a reasonably good announcement. Pardon me. But it actually went up over 400% in the day. And that was just, <coughs> pardon me, it was just, uh, I guess the dopamine hit was, it was just wild. And I had clients that had bought the stock a week earlier that in the end were suddenly up 700%. I had clients that were now looking at getting close to a break even. And um, it was just one of those occasions that just goes to show that downtrodden assets, those that are unloved, can suddenly become um, popular. I'm not, I'm not going to do a deep dive through my stocks. Um, I think most of you know where to find me. But I just think in this, in this era that 
Small caps have been certainly beaten up for the last couple of years. I think the majority, the majority to some extent in other assets have, have done exceptionally well. But I just think it's a sector that will continue regardless of the economy, regardless of where property goes. But there are very exciting opportunities out there. Uh, I, I research them. And I'm just looking for every everything I buy, I look with a four to 500% return. And again, uh, you, you've just got to put up with a couple of years being underwater and uh, copying shit on social media. But um, as I say to people, markets largely are a collective of people uh, with no friggin' idea what they're doing, and it's up to us to make the most of it. But again, pretty scary, those um, AI images. So what I've done, I have as my pinned tweet, I recorded a video of my top stocks for 2024. Uh, that's that's my pinned on X. So you're welcome to have a look there. Uh, some of them have, have shown some good signs already. Uh, we have diversified. We're also into the likes of silver. Uh, copper's making a bit of a comeback. Uh, rare earths, interestingly, with um, Gina Reinhart backing Arafura and the government's now backing them. That's a rare earth company uh, with the project near Alice Springs. So there's lots to like about uh, the value in the sector. I have uh, Ron Osborne, who, who does a lot, uh, has built me a website. Uh, I don't need to run through all the stocks. You can sign up there and I'll, I'll send you some insights. Uh, I think I've understated and over-delivered but that's up, up for debate. And what else have I been doing? So pretty much exercising. Uh, I'm not as cut as this guy. Uh, no alcohol. Haven't had a drink for 15 months. I say no to carbs where I can. I say no to sugar. Uh, I, I pretty much eat meat. Uh, I do have a few little, uh, few little sweets. Basically, ice, ice cream with a bit of stevia and, and vanilla paste. But on the whole, I, I've stuck to this regime. Since I've been strict, I haven't had any cheat meals. Uh, I'm in the gym five to six days a week. I'm not skimping. I, I'm loving it. Uh, the mental clarity and is great. I'm now wearing a size 39 shirt. And, you know, and my my life trajectory was heading towards um, Norm in the first slide. And I just think that we certainly underestimate uh, the need to look at our lives, especially when we're under financial, emotional, and all the other stresses that are only going to in intensify. And if I could um, give everyone a lecture, if there's one takeaway, uh, pun intended, that you could take away from what I'm doing is just cut out seed oils, uh, cook, cook your stuff in animal fat, smear yourself in beef tallow, give up cosmetics and all that shit. So um, anyway, that's the end of the formal presentation. Tony, that was uh, very interesting. Thank you. And uh, as you say, slightly different uh, uh, mode of engagement, but wonderful um, content nevertheless. And uh, a lot of people in the chat were uh, talking about it. Uh, Alison says, I love carbs. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Eric asks, what happened to your blood pressure? Do you know? Has it dropped? or what? Um, I actually went 115 on 75 recently. Mm. Uh, which is, I think that's almost almost normal. Uh, it's certainly within the healthy range, but I was, oh, you know, I was 150 on 90. I, I think, um, honestly, we could have, we could have a week, you know, uh, and multi long hour show on, on health industry. I, I'd rather, I'd rather leave it, Martin, but uh, there's just so much, I guess we all just go with the flow and I, I know viewers don't like to listen to bullshit, but I've, from my extensive research, um, I've found something that works for me. I don't suggest, uh, and the good thing is, you can pretty much do it as an elim elimination diet. Just just eat meat, seafood, dairy, eggs for a month, and then gradually add stuff in. If you, if you miss your vegetables, um, for sure. But I 
I think from what I've learned is that the real, apart from um, Dr. Kellogg, uh, you don't really want to research him, but guys like Ansel Keys, um, the Harvard scientists that were paid off to demonise fat over sugar, that's led to well over 60 years of of the health um, of, of people just going downhill. But anyway, that's that's a totally different story. But, um, you know, during the quiet times, I've done a lot of research um, and um, I'm happy and it works. So I guess do your own research and, as Scott Pape would say, choose your own path. Yeah, I think choose your own path. But uh, what we do know is that uh, a lot of the manufactured food that uh, a lot of people eat has very high salt content and very high sugar content, not least because those two ingredients are extremely cheap. And so they can bulk out essentially the weight of the um, food that's actually being sold and they might dress it up as looking um, healthy or looking uh, good. But actually, if you peel back the onion and look at what's actually making up, then, you know, you'd probably have a different thought. Um, so, you know, understanding that what you eat does determine who you are. I think that's a really important observation. And one of my observations generally is that, um, you know, you, you can get yourself in the situation where your mind gets f- a bit fogged <laughs> simply because of the stuff that you're consuming. And, and so the connection between what you eat and your attitude and your state of mind, it's all connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's cer- certainly fascinating. And I think whilst we're waiting for the the main program to come. I just think there's lots of other things you can certainly do, but in order to, to, to fight and to get yourself ahead and to cover, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the money of um, pulled in having working in the gig economy um, goes directly to my son's private school fees. So there's, there's obviously a reason to do it. And I think when, when, when my job gets busy, um, I'm around millions of dollars and decisions. Uh, clients, some of them will win lotto and they'll have a lotto win to take. But then suddenly they lose respect for money. And that's that's what dopamine does. And I think that we went on a wild spending binge. Uh, we bought, bought a lot of stuff that our friends probably don't like anyway. And, and now we're going to have to undo all that good work. And I look at, I look at, Cars. Uh, I drive. Um, I bought a Chinese SUV uh, for my wife originally. Now it's my it's my workhorse, and I get lots of compliments on on the car. And it's 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 a Chinese ripoff. And again, you, you know, we've had we had this stage at the stage where do you know if photos are real? Do you know if people are real? Do you know if anything's real? Why would you bother um, buying something unless you're going to trade it and try and sell it for a higher price? So, I think what we're witness witnessing now is pretty much. I think we're coming to a a bit of a crucial point with consumerism. Uh, to be honest, uh, it's taken me a lot of time to wake up. I went through that. Um, you know, join the police have good money when you're young, buy buy a car and flashy stuff and get into stockbroking and, and think that um, things make you happy. Well, well, they don't. Um, and I've learned finally that really no one cares. Uh, if, if you keep up, you know, you look at car manufacturers, they're the best marketers of all time because especially Kia, I admit I have a Kia, They'll um, keep adding a few new features and cars at one point were advertising that they had bloody um, car, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto and they make you want it. They want, make you want to upgrade as if you're not going to be happy in your top of the model. But then three weeks later, once it becomes a habit, um, you regret it. So I just think, you know, you, you've got to break away from all this consumerism. I, I can see that. Uh, families are going to bunker down. It's pretty much every person for themselves. And it's just going to turn to a shit show. Uh, but it's just um, it's just a case of how long it goes on. So one of the observations that you made was that, um, you know, markets are a, a bit crazy and a lot of them actually don't really know what they're doing. And, and I, I just wanted to reflect on that because if you look at the start of the year, 
pretty much all markets were saying, oh, rates are going to get cut. Uh, we're going to see, uh, you know, the, the markets um, reacting to that. And now what we're seeing is, you know, you mentioned the RBA, well, you know, very, very vague about where things are going to go. We've got um, the uh, story in Japan where they moved the rate very slightly positive, but it's still very, very low. We've got the Fed meeting this week. We've got the Bank of England meeting this week. Almost always, it just seems to me that they're going to say, well, we're waiting for more information. We're not sure. So the markets were ahead of themselves. And, and yep. it became, to my mind, and what you think, um, Tony, a bit of a, you know, a reinforcing philosophy, which then drove the markets higher. And then we had the AI piece of the puzzle. And as I've featured on my show previously, you know, if you look at the overall market versus AI, well, the AI stocks moved up like NVIDIA, but a lot of the ones more broadly in the market didn't. So we've had those two fundamental drivers which have actually forced the markets higher. And it seems to me that, I don't know what you think, but a lot of the people in the markets who don't really know what's going on have just been buying the, the, the movement. So it's, it's, it's trading the momentum. But is it going to come unstuck, do you think? Oh, it has to. It's, um, well, you look, at, you look at what happened uh, in, in dot .com. Uh, it, it came unstuck. Yeah, there's lots of um, there's lots of good news baked into into markets. Uh, the the lithium revolution, the EV uh, EVs forever saw lithium companies priced at absurd levels, and unfortunately, apart from those that have been taken over or managed to get in production, the rest of the sector has turned to complete shit. So I. I Completely accept the fact that that AI has driven it. Um, the Magnificent Seven has pretty much driven the S and P five hundred to these levels. It's it's been an absolute pain in the ass for those in ETFs that have bet against that. But I think it will come unstuck, just like price to income ratios are going to normalise to some extent. But it's just going to take some time and how it unwinds. You've just got a unique market here. But, but generally, markets, not only do they revert to the norm, but then they'll overshoot to the downside. And I've been through two years of that in, in gold stocks where the commodity has done nothing but outperform and biotech stocks that have, been, have done nothing wrong. And it's just been two years of absolute pain i've never had a tougher time certainly in my career than with the lack of funding the lack of sentiment and sentiment can turn if you can have a little biotech stock go up 700 percent in a few days you can certainly have things start to unwind and this is this is a terrible analogy but you know you're a new couple you know you're getting right into it and both of you are trying to hold in your bodily functions, whether that the toilet, passing gas, or, or whatever, having a shower. And then suddenly one breaks that, and then all bets are off. And I think that's how delicate our markets really are. And I'll only take a couple of negative sessions, and then the fear game's back on. So we're pretty much tiptoeing through the tulips at the moment. Volumes aren't convincing at all. And there's pockets of absolute stupidity, which you're still seeing in real estate, which you are seeing on the stock market. Uh, I remember four years ago, there were stocks that went up 10 times in a day. Well, I'll tell you what, these traders are making a comeback and they, they've been in a couple of my stocks and um, it was just, you know, cue the Benny Hill theme song as to how clients reacted, Martin. Yeah. Because... Generally, whilst people are inherently good, uh, they've got no, we've got no idea what we're doing. And unfortunately, those with some idea what they're doing, are cut, they, they're putting to doubt over people that don't know what they're doing. It's, it's a funny thing, markets, and understanding the psychology of it. And I tell you what, the master, the, yeah, let's give this guy a PhD in investor psychology um, to Cookie Boy. There you go. Absolutely. No pressure, Cookie. <laughs> and in fact, Cookie Boys, um, let me just put this one up. It's quite good. 
Um, there you go. Um, there's a lot of stocks which are cheap, and it's a great time to bring down your price average full stop. And I guess that's the point. Portfolio view is, is, is also quite important, right? Um, and at a time when everybody's zigging, there is an opportunity to zag um, and hold your nerve. And you know, I, I know a few people are doing that at the moment as well with what's going on. But um, if you go back to fundamentals like price earnings ratios, you know, if you look at NVIDIA, price earnings on NVIDIA is about 32 to 35, depending on when you calculate it. And I remember the, um, the, the Cisco's of this world and the Sun Microsystems around the dot-com bubble, they were in the mid 30s as well. Um, if you look at the price of Cisco today, it's, it's significantly down. So if you take a long term view, right, um, you know, we're probably in bubble territory. Um, but then, of course, there are others who buy the buy the run, as it were, and uh, uh, essentially just saying, well, you know, if everyone is doing it, I'll do it. So I guess that takes us to a bit of an, a fundamental question about trading versus long term holding of stocks. and. I, I get the sense from what you're saying, Tony, is that, you know, in a portfolio world, there's an opportunity to do some trading to be able to actually, you know, chase some value, but you're going to lose some as well as gain some. And, and I guess, how does that philosophy map to those who actually, maybe the Warren Buffett school of, of motoring that says, you know, it's about finding those out of price stocks and then holding them until they become good. How do you mix those two philosophies? Oh, that's that's a great question, and it should be known that Warren Buffett uh, called his stocks um, the cigar puff stocks, where they had one last drag on them. And Warren was heavily into specs, but he became too big for for the spec market. So he, then he went into blue chips and and long term holds. But where where I sit in my investment, well, speculative strategy is that you cannot buy some stocks and then stick your head in the sand. You have to, I call it effective use of capital. So you do have to do a bit of trading and, and build up the fundamentally sound companies. Uh, and that means if something increase, if I look on the screen and I'm seeing computerized trading, I'm seeing questionable buy orders and questionable sell orders. I'll act accordingly. So I try and assess how much of this announcement is real, how much is computer-driven buying, and how much is FOMO. So it is certainly, it's just a tough game. Uh, I, I don't know. I think, I think the struggle now uh, for the younger generation is the... You know, my, my son gets bored after two se seconds watching a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> the attention span, I just think the the brain structure, the psychological tendencies to hold anything, I think are gone for now. And what I've noted is that I have some great clients who they're accumulators. They're building positions on the back foot and they're prepared to hold, but they're very, they're very rare. And and the growth in these numbers really is um it's sweet fuck all, honestly, in how they become good investors. So I think everyone can look at a long-term chart uh, and thinking, um, I should have held that stock. And we all get the, the warm and fuzzies. But, you know, who'd have thought that a company like Monster Beverages would be one of the first companies to 100 bag um, selling energy drinks? So sometimes the best investments are... Close to you. Uh, I was talking to my son about Fortescue, how it was a nine cent stock. Andrew Forrest backdoored in all those iron ore assets, and it went from nine cents to about two hundred not two hundred and ninety dollars equivalent. So he um, he said, "Well, you know, if you put ten grand into that, you'd now be worth this." only if you're in prison without Wi-Fi or in a bloody coma. So let, let's be honest, most investors, speculators are totally full of it. And um, it was funny because at the house I was living, I used to get mail sent to me for Fortescue um, and then a company called Redback Mining, which went, which went to the moon as well. So I think it, it's a bit of luck 
but generally uh, humans are wired to to buy high and and, and sell low. So I I think that um, you know that they'll say there'll never be another Beatles or never never be another Rolling Stones or but um, there certainly won't be another Warren Buffett, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's an interesting story of, uh, you know, his philosophy and approach. And I have to say that um, whilst there is a lot of information around um, that people are using sometimes to try and make um, decisions, I think the information is, is quite filtered. And if you look carefully, some of the critical information that you really need to be able to actually make good decisions is not readily available unless you are um, in the corporate briefings that, of course, some of the big investment uh, houses can get hold of. So it's actually quite difficult for, I think, ordinary um, investors to get on the inside track to know what's really going on. And uh, my own concern is that, in fact, we have almost a two-tier market. But we actually have larger uh, entities who are able to play the inside field. And you've got a lot of ordinary investors who are looking in, as it were, over the fence, but are not actually able to benefit from the same information flows. And um, I get more and more angry with these selective briefings that seem to be more and more part of the uh, the, the landscape at the moment. Yeah, I, I think... Um... Yeah, certainly, certainly some valid points there. And I know that um, stockbrokers slash corporate people um, cop, cop a lot of shit, but who else is going to fund these companies? Uh, you can't hand around the plate at church. Uh, these guys don't don't win Powerball. So there are people that are there that have to step up. And there are periods where those that are funding these companies actually are getting smashed as well. So what what I what I tell uh, mums and dads is to go to these conferences, uh, these biotech mining. These are where the guys running the companies uh, they're human beings as well. Mm. Uh, go have your your sausage rolls, your free quiche, and as much alcohol normally as you can drink, and I and eyeball them. And my my best winners over many years come from going to a conference. And sometimes I'll come back from one thinking. Is there a catch on this company? Uh, one of them was Spartan Resources, which was the old Gascoigne. I think they were trading at 11 cents, had everything going for them. And I, I worked out that their potentially their tax losses were worth multiples of what the company was trading at. And I thought, well, is this too good to be true? Um, I had some people buy it. I, I didn't buy it, but um, five, 600% later. Uh, there are cases where it can work out, but there's a lot of lot of times where, you know, you will buy something. Um, your thirteenth man on the deal team. Um, you've got a tip from your Uber driver or your taxi driver, and and you get absolutely slaughtered. But I can assure you that, uh, you know, even when you're as confident as you can be on the fundamentals of a company, oh man, you can look stupid for a number of years. And um, the beauty about having other people dictate what happens with a stock price is it makes me look like a genius, stupid, or a criminal. And it's like you, you know, you're in the lolly aisle and um, someone comes up and slaps you in the face because the three-year-old's chucking a tanty. It, it's just amazing. But you've got to, I guess we're in, you know, information is everywhere. It's quick. Uh, people don't have much of an attention span. They'll... They'll jump in and out, but sometimes the, the best trading tool is your backside. So I think, yes, markets, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll have a correction. Um, and then people say, well, if, if the market, if the industry is correct, then what hope for the small caps? Well, I'll tell you what, the small caps have had, had a two year train wreck uh, whilst all the other stocks have done well. And, and that's, you know, I look at it in the way that I really fear once any other asset such as property is even fairly priced, the pain we're going to go through. But at this point, uh, my point is that it's clear that I think complacency has taken over. Uh, we'll just glide into the rates decisions. But again, um, once people start losing their jobs, uh, watch out. And then once... 
uh, we cut our spending, then businesses defaults go through the roof. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to happen. There's there's no easy way out of it. You just can't control or delete the economy in the world, Martin. No, and you mentioned the, the cuts. In fact, Cookie Boy asked, um, so when cuts, you know, and that's a, it is a good question. Um, there was an article that came out uh, the other day uh, here that said that, um, you know, a lot of people were now suggesting that maybe it would be uh, next year before rate cuts were coming into Australia. And uh, the uh, Michelle Bullock interview, which uh, I listened to, um, <laughs> I have to say, these press conferences that the RBA runs are just completely Mickey Mouse, right? So very simple, very simple Dorothy Dixon questions, very simple answers, didn't really actually provide any extra insight. But uh, at least they're being, whoops, at least they're being, quote, transparent. But, um, you know, she did say it's equally balanced. It might go up, might go down, might go sideways, and, you know, we'll have to watch and wait and see. And it seems to me that that's what a lot of central bankers are actually doing, and they're waiting to see because they, they don't know either. So um, the worry I've got, to Tony, is that a lot of people have been banking on the holdout, you know. So I've got a mortgage. I know that mortgage rates is high, but hopefully rates will come down and I can then find a bit of relief that way. And the longer this goes on, the more likely it is that the rate cuts when they come will be later and will be shallower. So my own perspective is that to those who are holding their breath and hoping that rates are going to come quickly by way of cutting are probably fooling themselves. I oh, totally, totally agree. And then you, you have to look at it from a family by family balance sheet perspective as to how can you cut all the the costs out and how can you live finally live um, at or below your means and I think we're about to um, get some expensive lessons in that we've been living well above our means for a, from the point of bloody socializing going out eating out buying buying a pint or, or schooner uh, I just think yeah we're in for a massive lesson and I, I look back at a tweet uh, which I, I didn't say and it was saying, you know, one of the epicenters of the housing bubble, uh, Toronto, um, around 1970, two and a half times income for a house. And that that was the same level for Manly Vale, where I lived. Um, you paid three times. Um, I paid less than three times to live in Bondi. Uh, it's, it's insanity. And I, you think, well, and then there was the argument that rates would, I copped it that people said that rates will never go up in our lifetime. Oh, geez. Um, yeah, come on, think about it. Think about it. We're still we're still nowhere near the norm for rates, but you look at the damage. Look at the damage it's done. Uh, people on sadly one point nine nine percent interest rate for for two years, uh, straight up to six. And that, if that doesn't affect your lifestyle, um, I don't know. I don't know what will because it affects your psyche, how you spend. So, you know, you, and you look at um, the poor Japanese that have, you know, they they squirreled money away and and didn't spend. So they've they've had had lost decades. I'm just hoping that, you know, I know we've been saying it for a while that best case, do we do what Ireland's done and have a bit of a correction, but. Um, Geez, what what a time to be functioning um, in the economy at the moment, and what you know some of the lessons our kids are going to get are the beauty of it is I I give my I give my fifteen year old son a life lecture on on every trip, and he's he's worried about his future, and he's worried about cars, he's worried about should he take a salary or commission, um, but at least he's not worried about owning a house. Yeah, and talking about um, you know what a lot of people are scratching their head and thinking about at the moment, one of the observations I have is that we seem to have the situation where the concept of debt is now absolutely wired into society. You know, if you went to university, you've got a hex debt. Um, if you've got um, a credit card or a buy now pay later, you know you, you're running debt to stand still. And then of course you've got the mortgage and. Uh, and other debts too. And it seems to me that we've got a situation now where the idea of being up to your eyes in debt is the norm. 
And I have to say I'm quite concerned about that. And one of the reasons why I think this is a really important conversation at the moment is because of where interest rates have gone, because debt is now costing a lot more. At one stage, interest rates were really low, and so the cost of debt was quite low. It's no longer the case. But it seems to me there's a broader question here about education and, and philosophy. And, and you know, even in schools, there's not enough focus on helping people to understand the implications and consequences of debt. And as you say, the rates at the moment, they're not, you know, over a long term average that that high. So there is a really big question as to whether we've built this whole sandcastle on, um, you know, a very, very weak foundation of more and more and more debt. And, you know, you can you can put charts like this up, which shows that the global debt it's pretty much gone through the roof in, in, in US dollar terms, you know, and, and still rising. So we've actually got ourselves where society, individuals and countries are now built on debt. And I suppose the question in my mind is whether this is ultimately unsustainable or whether we'll just go on increasing the debt and increasing the debt and increasing the debt and, and telling future generations, oh, well, everybody just has debt. You know, it's the norm. What do you think about that? That's... Uh Oh, 100% spot on. And uh, apart from divorces and women, cars have been my, my second weakness. And I'll, I've had the chance to simply sell a few shares and, and buy a car with cash. But I, I seem to keep making the same bloody mistake of thinking, I'll just take out a loan. And then you're used to the car in three weeks, yet the loan follows you around for five years. And, and that's my regret because at the time when I had that chance, my because I was in the fog of I was overdosing in dopamine, some of my companies were actually overvalued. And all I had to do was sell a bit and then not owe a cent on the car, not have to go through any debt. Uh, admittedly, I locked this house in for five years at 2.64, but I could have sold what was at the time and an expensive portfolio and owed a lot less. So I tell you what, my, my kids are going to certainly going to get some lectures. And here's my chance really to, to reiterate, look, I've made some mistakes and you can learn from it. You do not have to make the same mistakes. You do not have to eat shit food and not go to the gym until you're 40. You can be different. You can be like some of my best client, younger clients who are people that are accumulators. They know the key is slow slow and steady and, and no stupid debt. But I think, I think you're going to see in the newspaper where, yeah, I think, I think we reached almost peak insanity when that eight-year-old kid, there was a story on the eight-year-old that was a landlord. Um, yeah, I mean, like, are you friggin' kidding me? I think, yeah, that that was that was kind of, I don't know, the bung, the bell's been rung a few times, but that that was peak peak insanity. I don't know, you probably saw that story. I did, and of course, there's a lot more. And Edwin and I discussed it yesterday on the show. Um, we think that it might be connected to the fact that the father is also uh, an author and uh, writes books on um, property and finance. So it may be a little bit more broad than just uh, you know a kid who actually has a property. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's always more to it. But but it is interesting, and, and it goes back to this question of um, you know if everybody is going in one direction, should you follow the herd or should you actually stop and think about it and say, hang on a moment. Is there a different path? And um, to my mind, the whole concept of getting to grips with what debt is and how it actually can strangle you over time is actually something which I think is really important. I've seen so many people who actually struggle with this whole concept because everybody else is living a life powered by different forms of debt. And it's become the norm. And they work out now how much more debt they can get by what they can afford to pay back rather than actually thinking about this more holistically. Uh, and, and their lifestyle is effectively now in, inflated to a much higher level simply because of the amount of debt in the system. Now, the banks love that, of course, because they earn interest on it and um, people can keep up with the Joneses as a result of it. But is it is it healthy? Is it wise? And all I'm wanting to just question is, you know, it, it is the way that society has been steered into this debt-driven debt looming future 
sensible. And of course, governments have the same problem because, of course, we've got massive amounts of debt at the government level too. So I, I just think sometimes we should just pause and think about it. And, you know, there are alternatives, even if those alternatives may mean owning less and living a different type of life. Um, but maybe it's um, a better life because uh, you're in more control of your own destiny rather than being in hot to the um, to the banks or whoever else. Yeah, a couple of things there. Uh, it's obviously Juliana, my, my future wife. Um, she's from Hungary, and she she's not on social media. She doesn't snap herself taking photos of food. She doesn't give a shit about what anyone else does. She doesn't need fancy stuff. But I think there, what really has helped me in life is her brutal honesty. She's just honest. Will tell me if I'm sucking at this. Will tell me if I'm cooking the wrong way. But she is brutally honest. And I think the flip side of that is you get an honest playfulness at the same time. But I think we, as parents, uh, we've had it built into us that our kids don't want to hear the truth. Let's let's give a merit certificate to little Johnny, and yeah, let's accept that. Not you know. Winning doesn't matter. Succeeding doesn't matter. You have to go out and get debt. You have to get a hex debt. You have to marry someone you eventually hate and lose 80% of your assets. You do not have to do that. But who's going to have the balls to go in and start teaching kids that uh, this stuff? Tell them the truth. Teach them about a price to income ratio. Teach them about loan serviceability. Teach them about the depreciation in a car and what having to, to work in the gig economy, uh, the value of money, the effort required just to maintain a completely fake lifestyle. Um, I, I have a laugh. I, um, I have coffee with a client every month and I, I do it in a beautiful suburb and I drive along the street and I've never seen one rich person, well, I assume they are, on their bloody balcony. Not, not one on that street. And I, I get, I derive a huge amount of humour reading the Sunday paper in Perth as to how great a house is, how it made, made them feel like they're in a tranquil Balinese environment and they're just waiting for a greater idiot to buy the house off them. I mean, I'd love to have a serious conversation with someone as does, does a dust-collecting mansion actually make you happy? Because my guess is they get the dopamine hit, then suddenly they've got to find a greater idiot. But at the moment, um, egos are, are so up there that they might luckily find a buyer. And I just look at the the mansion, how mansions are being thrown around. Um, you know, I've, I've had, um, I, I, we got to build a house in a good suburb, a new house. Um, I'm just as happy in, in the little villa I'm in now. So I guess society will will adjust to it. Uh, the kids coming through, are price to income ratio is going to get down to six to seven times in Sydney or Melbourne. Well, history will tell us, and Morgan Kelly would say, yes, they will. That means they're probably four to five times in Perth and, you know, Perth's still affordable. And that's what I'm noticing from my survey of the um, drunken Irish, Martin. <laughs> Plenty of those around, particularly in Perth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, look, one other observation before we, we, we close out, because I just want to take the conversation one step further. Yeah. You know, understanding the value of money and the concept of money is something that's really, really important. A lot of people, I think, these days, because it's all digital, they don't have a feel of the value of money. And I, I watch kids specifically um, who, who seem to assume that their parents have infinite supplies of money. They just waggle the plastic card and magically it happens, right? Um, there's no consequences, therefore, when you spend. There's no feeling of the loss of physical cash going out of your wallet when you actually go buy something, right? And I think that that's really, really important. So one of the observations is that um, when you start giving kids bank accounts when they're very young and, you know, even, even things like being able to, to move money around digitally, you actually lose the sense of loss when you spend. And I think that is a really, really important observation because I'm seeing a generation now who just assume infinite supply. And that, of course, is just not true, is it? 
No, hell no. And I think we're, we're eventually, my way of thinking is we're going to get to a rerun of that 70s show, uh, to be honest. Uh, consumerism will find its way out. You're still going to have have all the social media. But, uh, yeah, I guess I guess the case of uh, with the, the stupid consumerism, I, I just reiterate to, to Lachlan, my son, I said, just get clothes that bloody fit you. It doesn't matter how expensive it is. If it doesn't fit you, you don't need a fancy car that you have to park in a disabled spot so you don't get scratched. There's nothing wrong with having good stuff that, that just gets the job done. And, and unfortunately, um, I'm 52 now, that I've been through all the cycles, I've been through boom, bust, and finally I've worked it all out that um, a lot of things are simply it's a fugazi it's not real you don't need it um for me a good piece of steak brings brings happiness being able to go to the supermarket and not feel pressured as to what i'm buying feels good i get more joy out of finding cheap protein um than a cheap car it's 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 how you go about life but again we humans are sheep Humans are sheep. And what, what I've found is that through my driving experience, you'll see 30 cars lined up in the left lane. So I'll go the right lane. And what's helped me is that Perth drivers are so polite. I don't have to be that much of a bully to get where I want. So we are. We line up. We do stupid things. We fall for all these scams. But that's just human behaviour. Because if you look at all the educational markets, I mean, stock markets go back to the 1600s. We've had bubbles since then. We've had mispricing of assets. Um, fear is temporary, greed is perpetual, and human stupidity is infinite. <laughs> well, that's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, Tony, as always, um, great insights from you tonight. And uh, I want to say thank you very much for, for coming on again. Um, I've put the link to your site in the chat and I've yeah. put it up on screen a couple of times. So if people want to find out more about uh, your stocks and things, they they can go there. And um, uh, I wish you well with uh, your traverses and, um, you know, your conversations in, uh, in in Uber. If you go on doing that, that's fascinating. I actually get great insights from my one-to-one -one conversations with people as well because it's really interesting and really important to hear and, and listen as well as actually, you know, be on transmit all the time. So I think that's a, it's a really good thing to do. So um, any last uh, thoughts before we uh, close out? Uh, um, you know, what I think we're saying is this um, – world that we're in is um you know a little bit wobbly at the moment and uh, probably some more uncertainty ahead true uh humans generally are doing the best uh they've been bullshitted in multiple directions we're going to pay the financial price of it and, and i guess you only realize in the brightest sun that you truly suck at cleaning car windows, and that will not be my third job. <laughs> very, very important point there, Tony. Well, thank you very much. Have a great uh, evening over there, and I uh, look forward to catching up down the track. I'm going to take you offline, and I'm then going to close the show generally. See you later, Tony. Thank you. There you go, folks. Well, I hope you uh, found that uh, stimulating, interesting. Um, the thing about Tony is he's always... Um, calling it as it is and uh you know excellent for that now next week cameron murray is coming back we're going to talk about the housing hijack he's just published a book and uh, we're going to talk talk a little bit more detail about that and uh, what his research has shown so join us for that um otherwise uh, we will take a final look at the dogs they're still in their um sleeping positions they haven't really gone very far at all you may have had a couple of uh shakes and what have you because they just wander around occasionally but they're still there so that's the uh, story there and uh, i look forward to seeing you uh, on the show next tuesday live and if you uh, want to catch up on other shows meantime of course they're all up uh, uh, i make shows most days so please like subscribe and share these shows really appreciate that thanks for all the comments and uh, all, all the um, super chats and everything else that's been thrown in there and uh, i look forward to seeing you next time this is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.